then we can look at social situations, again, playing into the socialization process, which is reorienting us because I know there's like a lot of examples that I give and sometimes they can seem tangential um getting off of like what the real goal is here but social situations again is where the socialization process happens so we can look at the play environment and the types of activities that a person might engage in the play space is going to have a big influence on activity participation and or activity selection It could have gender-associated values based on the types of tools or equipment that is in the environment. Or if you're playing a game, right, it could have a gender-associated value to the game. Equipment accommodations, are those available? The space could also have influence on personal attributes. So is are we in a competitive situation? Do we have to implement strategy? Or like are we doing team against team, one against one? What are the goals and is it a play like let's have fun goal or is it like one team's trying to win over the other? So I think competitiveness and strategy play play into each other a little bit. But we also have talk of intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. So any of you who have taken KIN 339, which I think is like an intro to sports site class, intrinsic and extrinsic motivation is like a a hot topic in that class. But the space constraints, right? If you have a small versus a large area, does the space permit a lot of participation or does it maybe permit limited participation? We can also look at the climate. If you live in Southern California where you have 90 days or 90 days, nine months of summer and it's not frigid, you go to the beach and you do beach activities, right? In my hometown, if it was really hot, we'd go swimming at my my aunt's house. So climate can have a, a role on the type of activity you you know engage in. If you go to the mountains and you're in snow, right? You could ice skate. That's more of a rink related thing. But if you're a pond skater, you know, also engaging in snow sports like what. What does what has the environment afforded you that will allow you to, to engage in activities that are done in that climate? Space constraints also give a person an ability to practice certain skills acquired in a space that permits more participation. So if you are like in a big field, let's use the soccer as an example, right? Soccer requires a lot of running, okay, and, and building endurance. So having the appropriate space that fits the skill is important for developing those skills. Or in this case, we could say developing endurance um, so that a person can be better at playing soccer. But having that space improves skill, which is going to prevent more participation. Okay, so that's kind of like an expansion of some of these things. I do want to comment again on gender associated values because what is in the environment in terms of tools or equipment. Some objects carry feminine values, some carry masculine values. Certain sports and activities are becoming more gender neutral. We've kind of already mentioned that. But this took me back to like my Disney Channel days with the movie Jump In. I don't know if you guys remember this one, but Corbin Blue High School Musical. Anyways, he was a boxer and then he got pulled into this double dutch trio um they needed four people to compete and he was he was roped in ha pun intended he was you know pulled into participating in double dutch and double dutch is i mean you see three girls participating in it double dutch is classically a jumping rope is classically associated with females and so he was kind of ridiculed by friends or family because Boxing, which is more of a masculine activity, and jump roping, which is more of a feminine activity. It was like, ooh, why are you participating in in jump rope, you know? So those are some commentary on the environment and how it plays a role in your activity level. Uh, Other social situations, toys. Oh my god, I have so much to say about gender typing in toys. 
the first thing we have is segregated toy section. So like these are where the boys, this is the, this is the aisle with all of the boys toys. This is the aisle with all of the girls toys. Does it make shopping for people a little bit easier? Yes, it does. But segregating toy sections is like saying, boys, you go down this aisle, girls, you go down this aisle, and you can't mix aisles. And then then you get into this like thing of lack of exposure potentially, but meh. anyways. Gender typing in toys can also be emulation of toy figures. So, you know, if somebody got an action figure of LeBron James or, in my sister's case, the Red Power Ranger, superheroes with, like, Marvel and DC uh, movies out are, you know, like, who wants to be Captain America? So emulation of toy figures can have a role in the types of activities a person engages with if they're emulating a superhero or a comic figure that, you know, beats the bad guys through, you know, I don't, it, it's violence. It is violence. But, you know, like, this is a fight scene. Wah! Right? And if they're emulating a fight scene, that's, that's a certain type of motor behavior. So emulation of toys or figures could be something that comes out of gender typing in toys. The degree of uh, facilitation to participate in physical activity could also come out from toys. So if we're looking at uh, different types of games, right, if you have a sedentary game like board games or playing with dolls and like grooming video games, the Wii, I would say, is kind of an exception. There are other video games out there now like Nintendo Switch that encourage you to be more active or you can play different activities through a virtual way but usually more you can have more sedentary games versus games or activities that promote more activity like giving somebody a ball or you know if you're looking at infants giving them something that uh, rolls like a push cart or something that they can start to use to walk around also gender typing we have to talk about marketing strategies so the types of commercials that you see or the packaging usually features a certain gender playing with that toy and that's to kind of put in place like this is a girl's toy so if we have these girls playing with these dolls like there are no boys in this picture therefore this is not a boy's toy that is how marketing works and the types of colors they use on packaging but it's also not just toys it's adult equipment as well Right. If you think about Father's Day, they're like, treat your treat your dad to a gift card to the Home Depot, you know, and then it's like get get him a new power tool or a barbecue or grill versus Mother's Day. It's like get her the gift of flowers or get her jewelry. Check out this makeup from Sephora, you know, like something like that. So Marketing strategies don't just apply in childhood um, or adolescence. They also go further into adulthood as well. Influences also um, in playing with toys. The parental persistence er, is a big one. Parents are the ones who usually buy the toys for the kids. Also, you could have a parent who's like, this is a toy I used to play with as a kid, so I'm going to give it to you, right? It could be a hand-me-down parental persistence it could be a new parental persistence like but they are the one providing the toy for the kid so it's saying this is this is a toy that is okay for you to play with but then we also have permanence as a part of our influence playing with toys and that's that gender roles stick with kids and that is kind of shown with research speaking of research there was a article or study that was brought up by the textbook authors and it showed that children adolescent association of activities fit with their respective genders. They, I, I don't remember. Oh, now I don't remember the study. I'm blanking. But I want to say that it's something along the lines of like saying like, would a boy or a girl engage in this type of activity? And typically children at a very young age were able to pair or associate certain activities with certain gender types. So that is an example of permanence in terms of like what we are taught at a young age does stick with us and it, the influence happens very quickly and very, very early on. But also with research in this area, 
is parental disapproval of participation across gender type activities. So again, that's kind of part of the parental persistence part, but if a parent disapproves of a of participation, like if I had a son and he wanted to dance, I would be wonderfully happy with that. Some parents, especially dads, I think are usually the big one if if we see boys in dance at all, the dads are the ones that are not supporting of the boys in dance because it is considered a feminine activity. And if the dad is like homophobic or is afraid of their son being gay, you know, then disapproval could And if the son just wants approval from his parents, disapproval of participation in the activity could cause the son to withdraw from engaging in dance. So these influences, parental persistence and permanence, have been supported in research. That was the main point of bringing those two things up. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about is race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status. And I think this discussion is super, super important, especially in the political climate um, that we're in. And again, it's it's the matter, it's a matter of semantics and definitions, right? Um, similar to how sex and gender are not the same thing, race and ethnicity are not the same thing. And a lot of times you guys will fill out surveys and it'll ask you, what is your race? What is your ethnicity? The thing that gets me the most is that there isn't always an option to select multiple races. So a person's race is their genetic similarity within groups, okay? Ethnicity, on the other hand, is cultural similarities within groups. And that's another thing that bugs me is that typically when you see ethnicity on surveys, it's are you Hispanic or are you non-Hispanic? which I think is it's rather fascinating because clearly there are a lot of other types of cultures in our society that are just not accounted for <laughs> in terms of eth- ethnicity portions on surveys. But race also, I think, I, I don't remember, I watched something a while back that it was like, oh, in 40 or 50 years, a large majority, like 80, some astounding percentage of the world's population was going to be multiracial or at least biracial, right? And a lot of times on surveys, you don't always have the option to choose multiple races. So like for myself, it's Asian or it's white. I don't get to choose both. And I love surveys that include like biracial, multiracial, other, and then you specify. But these two things are not the same. Race is more genetically related. Ethnicity is more culturally related. These two things have a more complex and interrelated influence on development. Influence, they influence participation in types of activities that distinguish one culture from another, right? So it, it could be um, in terms of ethnicity since the United States, de- like, I guess, separates this by Hispanic, non-Hispanic, right? It could be that Hispanic culture participates in, you know, like for Chloe, for, for um, I can't even speak folklorical dancing. I don't even know if I said that right. I hope I said that right. Ah. Anyways, your your culture, the types of activities that are a, an identity of your culture could influence the types of activities that you engage in. So I know uh, Asian communities, there's certain types of Asian dancing that you might not otherwise be exposed to if you didn't belong to that culture. Ethnicity and, and race can be distinguished or they can co- coincide with each other. So that's where we get this complex influence. Because if you're a multiracial person, right, some races are part of different cultures. So that's where it, like, the lines get blurred a little bit. And it's like, well, you have multiple influences from, like, I have influence from my mom's white side of the family versus influence from my dad's Chinese side of the family. So, you know, like, who has more of an influence? I don't know. <laughs> or what which which one of these has more of an influence? I don't know. Socioeconomic status is more along the uh, lines of being related to opportunity. Do you have the financial means to engage in certain activities? So I love to use this example for this one is my mom was a pharmacist and she like I would say she made a pretty good living selling drugs to people (laughs) 
in a very legal way. I used to like to tell people that my mom was a drug dealer. I just thought it was the coolest thing. But she was she was like pretty well off. And then in about I, we were still like a middle class family, you know. Um, but I think around the early 2000s, she had a really bad slip and fall accident and was forced to retire and has been living off of like disability stipends for the longest time now because she cannot work because her accident made it so that she couldn't stand for long periods of time. But in like the workers comp case that she had to go through and everything, her license ended up expiring and she couldn't practice pharmacy anymore or she couldn't act as a pharmacist anymore. So that led us to some financial discomfort, I'll call it, because my dad didn't, my dad has an interesting character, but he didn't make a whole lot of money and he didn't, you know, support any of our upbringing because he only would come home on the weekend. So we would get, you know, like dinner or lunch and maybe birthday gifts here and there, or he would pay for a family trip or something. But we didn't get a lot of extra um, financial support from him. And so our socioeconomic status, I think we still stayed in the middle class, but we kind of like dropped (laughs) pretty low in the middle class. Um, We still lived in like a good part of town. But I think these are like all of these things that I'm bringing up are huge parts of where like what a person is exposed to if you're in a low socioeconomic area you maybe live in more ghetto or less kept up areas of town there might be more negative influences floating around like if if there's I know in my town on like the bad side of town well we called it the bad side of town but you know like we had gangs we had um, more drug usage, and so it was like, oh, well, if if you're in that area, you're going to end up dropping out of high school, or you're going to be a teen mom, or, you know, whatever. So I think socioeconomic status has a huge role in the opportunities that a person is afforded, just because a lot of activities that we engage in do cost money, but also it's just a mean of access. Like, even if you're not paying for access, does the community provide you access? And this, like, I don't know. I have a lot of my own biased views on how we have health disparities uh, related to socioeconomic status and race and ethnicity. If you guys are interested, there is a really cool docu-series that we were... Well, we watched it in our grad seminar. It's called Unnatural Causes. And it's like this huge docuseries of doctors and researchers that talk about different cultures and races and how they are impacted health-wise by different factors that maybe not, maybe not are considered often. But it is, it is so informational. So if you... If you like documentaries or docu series, I I would recommend watching that one for sure. I do think you have to pay for it, eee! but it is like I would pay for it. I don't know. I thought it was really great. It was very eye opening, especially with the the climate that we're in currently. Okay, the last thing in this lecture is to talk about stereotype threat, and this is going to be uh, very much related with these three things, right? So it is the experience of being at risk of conforming to socio-cultural stereotypes related to racial, ethnic, gender, or cultural groups. So stereotype threats could be racially linked biological factors, which can play into, you know, a person's predisposed ability to perform certain activities. So I think a perfect example of this is African Americans in, like, track events like our, our long distance running or even just participation in, you know, like basketball or football, that type of thing, right? We, we have a lot of typically people of color are in lower socioeconomic status and it's like, ooh, you have this racially linked biological factor that allows you to be explosive in your movements and you have a lot of power, 
you potentially have a lot of endurance, right? It depends on their build, whatever. But it's like you can you can perform this activity. So we're gonna we're gonna put you in this activity and then you can get really good and then you can earn money. So sometimes we mix um, you know, like a socioeconomic status threat on a person by stereotyping them, saying like you can get somewhere because your race is typically oriented or associated with this certain type of task. So we're kind of linking success with race just because a person has been, or a a certain race, ethnicity, gender, culture has been stereotyped with that particular activity. It also, the threat is, is twofold. It's one, it's like kind of pressuring people in, but also individuals might downplay their abilities in order not to further the stereotype or in fear of being judged wrongly. So if it's like they're, they're trying to avoid the threat, that could deter participation in the in the activity itself. So I already used like boys and dance, but it's a great example like the stereotype threat is that girls do dance so it doesn't fit with the gender and so if boys don't want to be judged as being gay you know which I don't I don't I don't know anyways (laughs) if they don't want to be judged as being gay or feminine then that might deter them from participating in a stereotyped activity There's too much variability to discern specific influences um, between race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, and physical activity um, or participation in certain types of activities. And again, it's mostly due to this complex interaction between race, race and ethnicity. I cannot talk today. But it's also, you know, we have within our, our race, within our culture, we have our significant figures such as our parents, our family members, peers, that, etc. And we have different social situations that are associated with certain cultures or races that are going to play a role in shaping our involvement in physical activity. So it's really hard to pinpoint any one of these environmental factors. Um, I think the best thing that we can do in terms of research and in terms of development and it is, is acknowledging that these factors exist. And then knowing how to kind of combat existing stereotypes or existing norms so that we're kind of providing a more well-rounded experience. That way we're promoting physical activity for everybody because we know there are a lot of health benefits from physical activity participation um, and we, we don't want that just for a certain type of person. All right, that concludes our lecture on chapter 15. I will see you guys in the next video.